Good morning, everyone. I'm General Jack Ripper, and this is a moment in time campaign of Combat Mission Battle for Normandy. And what I thought we'd do this morning is uh, I'm going to walk you through my briefing process, and uh, we're going to take a look at how you too can figure out the best way to tackle a combat mission scenario. One of the first things you want to do when you're starting up the game, I know there's a lot of new people, especially since the game's going to be available on Steam. I don't know if this one particular is, but one of the first things you want to do is take a look at your force structure. Today we're in command of 2nd Company Panzer Grenadier. It's a Kampf group, so that means there's miscellaneous stuff attached. Uh, such as this Sturmgeschütz 3, which is the only armored vehicle that I really have. I don't consider half-tracks to be armored vehicles. Uh, we also have attached forward observer and a couple of breach teams that are attached at the company level, so we're going to have to figure out where the hell we want to send those guys. They have four demo charges each. So one of the first things I do is I take a look at the overall force structure. So we have three platoons of infantry with various accoutrements. We have one platoon of heavy machine guns and uh, with one support vehicle attached. One support half track. It's a 20 millimeter uh, L55. Uh, these guys have a bunch of trucks attached. Other than that, they're just a standard kind of infantry platoon, machine gun section, and others. But the Panzer Grenadiers most notably have two machine guns per squad. That's one of the things I like about them. They have a lot of heavy firepower. And occasionally you can also get Panzerfaust that's in one particular squad, usually has a three, three team setup, and they have a Panzerfaust attached. Uh, shouldn't really need that though. My opponent is the British Airborne. This is the Arnhem Bridge map, and it's uh, we're, we're beginning our counterattack to try to secure the bridge. So that's going to be, uh, we're going to be up against a lot of infantry, maybe an anti-tank gun or two, I'm not sure. Uh, we can expect lots and lots of small arms. Uh, not too much support, though, because they shouldn't have any off-map artillery available, as far as I know. Look at all these smashed up vehicles over here. How did he even get this far? I don't know. So... That's one of the first things I do is take a look at my forces. What do I have available? I've got a company of infantry, including supports. And then the next thing you want to do is take a look at the map you're fighting on. Just kind of get to know it a little bit. we got some big wide open streets, diagonal and vertical. This is a built up area. There's a lot of buildings, a lot of tight spaces, a lot of windows, porches, overhangs, etc., etc. There's kind of an open field area over here. Shouldn't be too significant because I don't think I'm going to approach it from this direction. Our objectives are a big milk factory over here. It's east block over here, which is just a block of housing, which this place is actually going to be rather, uh, rather difficult to fight in. We've got some intel that there's some enemies in here, but of course there are. I mean, if you parked a full squad in this building inside, you would really need to be careful about how you approach it. As you can see, there's little gaps in between all the buildings, and that makes for insanely tight and small killing grounds. So probably the best move on this particular one is to actually come up to the wall over here and breach in through this wall to enter that building. Of course, once you enter this building, is there access? No, there isn't. So actually, if there's enemies in this building over here, you can breach in there too. That's not a bad idea. Something to consider. So when you're looking around, you should look at the buildings, the layouts, what type of buildings they are, where the windows are, where the doors are, how they're separated. In this case, they get a lot of tall walls in between them, which is good for isolating little backyard areas but it's really bad for trying to move from building to building because you either have to come out the front door here and run down the street which can be bad on multiple levels especially if they uh, the enemy has a machine gun team or something looking like stuck in a building and looking down the street yeah you don't want to use these front doors but it's also bad on the back side especially if there's not upstairs there is upstairs oh Jesus which means you can run out the back door to try to get in this building over here and an enemy team in the upstairs floor can shoot down at you while you're trying to move around. 
So one of the things about attacking a built-up area like this is you need to be very slow and very meticulous, which is going to be difficult to do given I've only got 50 minutes on the clock. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to decide our order of operations. So I've got a platoon out here. This is one platoon. They are veteran, mostly plus one. He's green plus one, so he's not going to be in front. And he's veteran plus zero. So first squad will be in the lead. They're going to be followed by third squad. And then second squad is going to be reserve because they're only green. And then the first platoon HQ, he's probably going to hang out in the half track unless the enemy spams piats at us. Uh, one of the reasons you want him in the half track is, first of all, to keep him safe, keep him protected. And secondly, this guy shouldn't really need to do any fighting on his own. He's got a Panzerfaust K, and he's got a couple of MP40s, and that's it. I mean, there's really no reason to risk him. Not to mention, if the half-track gunner becomes a casualty, uh, one of the guys in the team could replace him. It also gives him access to the vehicle radios, which work all the time, if the vehicle has radios. It does. So, that's fine. The individual squads, you'll note, do not have radios, so they'll need to remain within relatively close proximity to the platoon leader in order to exercise his command privileges. So, I think the objective for first platoon is going to be probably to move through the tram depot and then around to the milk factory. Otherwise, we're going to cross this street and we're going to use this side of the street to move down to the milk factory. But the milk factory, this 100 point objective, that's the job of first platoon. It doesn't matter if there's enemy forces over here. It doesn't matter if there's enemy forces over here. It doesn't matter if there's enemy forces over here or anything like that. Our objective is not to clear the map of the enemy forces. Our objective is to take our objectives. So as far as I'm concerned, if we look at the scenario briefing we have strum school milk factory east block three other miscellaneous ground objectives for a total of 175 and then destroy allied units is up to 500 for a total of a thousand points so that thousand points we probably don't need all thousand in order to get a good victory one thing we should do though is take the ground objectives at least the big ones so the the school the factory and east block and in the process of that, we will most likely destroy enough enemy forces, especially since the school seems to have some, uh, some heavy enemy forces on it. So we'll most likely destroy enough enemy forces to, uh, to satisfy that objective as well, or at least get a partial completion on it. So that's going to be the job of 2nd Platoon over here. 2nd Platoon has no attached vehicles whatsoever. So they're entirely on foot, and given that there is relatively built up area between them and the school, I mean, if I can put them in this block of houses right here, they can command all of this open ground around the school, no problem. And uh, that would easily allow me to, uh, to take care of, of business over there. Otherwise, they can, if they need to, they can advance down here which close combat players, you probably recognize this little square down here. Uh, it was a prominent part of the Arnhem map. And uh, it was actually the key to attacking that map was to actually take your British forces, move through this park, get into this building, and then cross the street over here, which allows you to flank the Germans out of their positions in the front of these buildings when you're attacking. Uh, I'm sure there's some com close combat two players out there. <laughs> um, so the school... Given the preponderance of enemy icons on it, there is some early intel available in this scenario. Uh, most likely, I'm going to use some support weapons, and I'm just going to try to destroy the school, or at least heavily suppress it. This infantry platoon, then most likely approach, is going to be to come down the back side of this street and get into these two buildings. You see this one's at an angle, so he can face out into the open ground here, and this one's facing this way, so he can cover to the side. And I do believe there are windows on the front, yeah, on the front and the sides of the building. So they can cover pretty well down this street too. Yeah. So one thing when you're when you're fighting in a city is if you're gonna look where's my zoom in key? There it is. If you're gonna look you gotta look at your sight lines. 
Right, this building down the very end of the block, it commands this street all the way down. All the way down to here. And this is literally the, the wall right up next to the river. So that one building all the way down the end of the street, this is a very good place to put some heavy weapons and uh, to command this open ground. It can see all the way down. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to give my heavy machine gun team an ancillary order. Let's see, that's first section. He is regular plus two, he's regular minus two. This is the second section, he's regular plus one, and he's crack plus two. That would be a great place for a crack machine gun team. So I'm gonna detach section two, and I'm gonna add them to this platoon. So, I think we've developed that platoon's objective. Second platoon supported by machine gun section is going to advance down the end of the block here. They're going to start securing the using L block here with the intention of pushing the enemy out of the school and uh, allowing heavy weapons in this building to dominate the street down here in front. This will help prevent enemy reinforcements from moving from the underpass, and it should also, if I push the enemy out of their positions over here, if the enemy tries to cross the street, it should allow us to, uh, to shoot them up as they go across. And then one of the other pieces of key terrain, if I'm not mistaken, should cover the bridge approach. So that would probably be this house on the corner down here would be the second heavy machine gun position and we would have it command this open ground behind the school. So if we can put heavy machine gun in front and behind the school, if the enemy moves out of the school, they'll get mowed down pretty easily. So for an objective of third platoon, because we do have third platoon here, uh, he's veteran plus two. Let's see, he's plus two green, plus two veteran, plus two veteran. So that's actually a pretty good platoon right there. And they have vehicles, which means they also have a ready supply of ammunition. So they could probably function as resupply units, at least for the start. I don't know how much ammunition I'm actually going to use. What do the half tracks have? Does he have 792K? 792K? No. 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 Nobody has 792K. All right. So that means my Sturm my MP44s, <laughs> MP44s, uh, they use 7.92K ammunition. He carries 210 rounds because he's got in 30 round stick mags, and there's no resupply for that particular weapon anywhere on this map. So one thing I'm going to have to do is when I separate my squads, this is part of uh, this is part of your briefing. Always check what weapons you have, what ammunition you have, how much ammunition is available, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I know for a fact I have eight breach charges. I have Neville for 41 rockets. I've got 105 millimeter howitzers, and I've got 81 millimeter mortars all off map. I do have a forward observer available, but it's going to be a little difficult on a map like this because there's no building that offers a good line of sight. I'm sure the reason this tall building over here is in place is so that if you were happen to play the scenario on the other side, I'm sure that AI would put their forward observer right in there and, uh, <laughs> and would allow it to at least see some of the map. But yeah, that's, uh, it's not particularly easy using a forward observer on, on, on a map like this. It's probably best to use a pre-planned artillery barrage, which we'll talk about in a minute. But one of the first things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to look at our squads and figure out what we're going to do with our weapons. Now, these guys have three and three, so I can just use the split squad command and get two teams, each with a machine gun, etc., etc. That's fine. And it's the same with these guys. They're four and four with nothing special, and they're three and three with nothing special. So I can just split squad, and we'll get guy, machine gunner, assistant, and automatic rifleman in each squad. And that should be fine. Um... And one of the reasons you want to split your squads, as soon as I find a squad I need to split, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Here we go, MP44. So one of the things you want to do is take note of any special weapons you have. 
So this squad has two teams. It's got one team of five guys with a machine gun, and the second team has a machine gun rifle and MP44. But you want to control access to special weapons like MP44, especially if you do not have ammunition resupply. So one of the things I'll do with this guy is I'll split off an assault team. And that will give me a team with short range firepower. He's got the MP40, two cars, and an MP44. And then the second team will be a heavy support team with two, count them, two MG42 light machine guns and two assistant gunners to carry ammunition and feed the guns. So the way you would exercise this particular squad now is you would use the forward team with the binoculars kind of as a movement team. These are the guys who are going to kick in the doors and go into the houses. And then the moment they've gone in the, in the house, here, we'll use this house as an example, right? Okay, so we're going to make our breach. I'll just, I'll just example it right here. I mean, why not? Okay, so your support team is in the rear facing the house. They can easily shoot at the house, right? They can, they can hit the house, no problem. Meanwhile, your assault team would be in cover from the house. Let's just say they would be back here. So one of the first things you do is let's just say I want to attack into this house. Everybody's back here, okay? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check my line of sight and my windows. I have windows in this in this house right here. So the first thing I would do is I would put my support team in this house so that at least one of my machine gunners, in fact, both of my machine gunners have stacked up in this window right here. That's, that's pretty good. We're covering the entire front of this building with two light machine guns. So if anybody sticks their head out and shoots, they're going to get mowed down. Then what you would do is you would take your assault team and you would order them to move up. Usually what I try to do is establish an intermediate spot just so I can move them out in the open and try to draw, and try to draw out any enemies that are in there. Otherwise what I'll do is I'll give these guys a target light command and I'll just put it on the downstairs floor. Or, if I'm assaulting straight into the downstairs floor with no intermediate position, I'll put it on the upstairs floor. Because what happens is, when they shoot at the front of the building, it's going to impact the front of the building, and it should suppress everybody inside. Then you take these guys and you order them, depending on what you need, what you need to do is you either do a quick move straight into the first floor while the upper floor is being suppressed, or you can give them a hunt command. That's if you're not suppressing the building and you want them to stop and shoot at any enemies they see. But usually I do a quick command right into the front of the building and that gets them inside. And if they see anybody on the way in, they'll shoot them. So that's how you would use this particular team setup. And the reason you want to split it this way is because you want to restrict access to the MP44 until the situations where you actually really need it. Because if this guy starts mag dumping at just this, the front of a building, like if you tell the squad to shoot at the front of the building, that guy with the MP44, he's going to start mag dumping into it, and he's going to be blowing off 30 rounds of his 210 rounds in no time. So you want to try to avoid that, because he'll run out of ammo very quickly, and in these types of situations, especially in built-up areas, the MP44 is actually a really decent weapon in these kind of close quarters like along with the submachine guns, you don't want these guys to burn through all their ammo. Now the reason I don't exercise this kind of caution with the submachine guns is very simple. It's because almost every single vehicle on this map has additional 9mm ammo. You can just give them more. Okay, like hey, you know, he's carrying he's carrying 137 rounds of 9mm. I don't know how he ends up with 7. He's supposed to have 30 round stick mags. But Let's just give him, you know, let's give him a couple more mags, right? A couple extra mags. There we go. Now he's got 187. And we put him back into place, right? After he assaults a house, or maybe two, you know, if he provided he survives, like I said, this very high casualty environment, um, if he survives, he'll probably be out of ammo. You can just hustle him back to the Kuba wagon and get some more ammo. It's very simple. But with the MP44s, you can't. So one thing you want to do when you're when you're loading up a scenario and you're looking at your forces is make sure what weapons you have and what ammo you have available. 
I mean, there's no problem using all of your MP40s. So if you can isolate your MP40s and use them that way, which say with this particular squad, you can, right? If I split off an assault team from here, what do I get? I get three guys shooting regular 792 and nine millimeter ammo. And then the other team has a pair of gunners and some standard 792 ammunition. So this particular team, I could load them down with extra 9mm ammo, and it wouldn't affect the mobility of this team at all. Like, these guys can still move around at their default speed. So it shouldn't be that much of an issue. I like how he's just sitting there with the Panzerfaust. He's like, oh yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna shoot that at somebody. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, I operate, especially in built-up areas, is I split my squads into teams. I have one team dedicated to just getting into a house, and I have another team dedicated to providing suppressive fire. And let me clear that target, although I'm probably just going to load my save game, but it doesn't matter. And then as far as platoon HQs go, yeah, I know, it's got two MP40s. Oh, that's so good, isn't it? Yeah, but you don't want to put him right out in front because losing that command bonus from the team itself and losing communications will, uh, will affect you quite badly. And then one thing I always do if I have an anti-tank team is I detach my anti-tank squad, my anti-tank team, and I keep them around with the platoon leader. And the rest of the squad will go here, and I look at this and I say, I can either split it two ways, which ain't bad, or I can then detach an assault team. And what I get here is, I like how they have the anti-tank logo, even though they don't have the anti-tank weapon. <laughs> good job, good job. Uh, these guys have the MP40, and they have a G43, and they have a Car 98, and they have a bunch of grenades. These guys have both machine guns, again, commanded by the assistant team leader, which is actually, I like having the assistant team leader out there. It makes it pretty nice. Why is he clipping through? Oh, because he's doing the assistant gunner thing. Okay. And then you also detach your Panzerfaust, and that keeps your, a your Panzerfaust and your AT rockets separate. Once again, this is a weapon that I don't have any ammunition resupply for. So if I actually need the Panzerfaust, it'd be a good idea to keep it safe, prevent them from being a casualty, and also don't waste their ammunition foolishly. I mean, there is an extra Panzerfaust in this half track here. And there is... I think that's about it, honestly. He's got 20 mil and 792. He's got 9 and 792, 9, 792, 9, 792, 9, 792. And then over here we have 9 and 792. And that's it. That's all I have. So that's the only pan. That's one of the only Panzerfaust I have. This team, I think, has. Yeah. Not Panzerfaust. Panzer Shrek. You know what I mean. So that's one thing to do. And to keep in mind on when you're uh, when you're planning out your scenarios, review your forces, review your weapons, review your ammunition capabilities, and then finally review your artillery. Because one thing you'll note, if I select the company headquarters, the Nebelwerfer is denied. You do need the forward observer in order to call that in, because it's accessible for the uh, the forward observer. It also delivery less than one minute that's because we're in the command state the the planning stage it'll be 14 minutes later not to mention the rocket batteries are notoriously inaccurate so one thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a point target and I'm gonna say hello goodbye six heavy maximum immediate confirm there we go that should deal with that particular problem, no problem. So in broad strokes, that's our plan. As you'll notice, I didn't I didn't plan everything. I mean, I've still got a bunch of dudes just sitting around, and I have no idea what I'm going to do with them, but that's fine. The only thing you need to do as far as your plan is figure out what your first move is and then establish, like, an overall plan. Like I said, this platoon, their whole job is to get into the milk factory and secure it. So this green square on the ground is their entire world 
and they're going to do whatever they need to do to get in here. One of the things to note though is that we've got tall walls in front and then we've got blank walls of buildings in here and then the only access to the milk factory is these couple of entrances right here. Very easily controlled by this building right here. A couple of a, a single enemy squad broken into two teams will easily stop anybody from getting in here. So one of the things you want to do when you're attacking a compound like this is check the internals. This is a blank wall, that's a blank wall, so there's no access from this building, there's no access here. We got a tall wall back here, it hooks up with that building, it goes this way, it comes all the way down around here. I mean, in order to get in the back side of the milk factory, I'd have to go all the way around this side of the map and then come in this way, right? Which, once again, leads to a tall wall with just a couple of very small gaps that's commanded by a building internally. So, here's another idea. We're gonna take one of our breach teams. We have a plus one veteran and a plus one veteran, and he's a plus one okay. I'd rather have the lower quality team on detached service, keep the higher quality team where I can keep an eye on him, and I'm just gonna put him in the half track with the platoon HQ. So now we have a breach team, and you might be sitting there wondering, did they did they fix the half tracks? Okay, they kind of did. The butts are in the seats, but I'm not 100% sure the half track is rendered at the at the appropriate scale. It does make me wonder, but either way, <laughs> it does make me wonder. Just a little. Sorry. One thing you'll want to note is open top vehicles like half tracks are very vulnerable to fire from second and third story buildings. So, like I said, this guy is strictly here to allow the platoon leader access to the radio and also just to keep these guys safe. But he's not going to be at the spearhead of any advance. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, that machine gun is valuable. I need to bring it somewhere. And the reason for that is every single team has light machine guns in it. So I don't need the half track to provide suppressive fire. I mean, if these guys were like pioneers or something and all they had was K-98s, then maybe you might consider using this after you take the passengers out and leave them somewhere else. And then you have one disposable guy on a machine gun in the half track, but, well, I shouldn't call them disposable, but, you know, I mean, let's be honest, everybody here is disposable. So the purpose of the breach team over here is, well, we've, you know, there's a pretty actually a pretty good opportunity here uh, this white building right here we got a blank wall facing here we could breach our way in to this building right here doesn't give us direct access to the interior but it does put us in a nice central location does it have any doors in between uh, no just front doors only hmm it might be worth getting into this building here then because I don't know how many enemy troops are in here. I don't know if there are enemy troops in here. I have no idea what the defense layout is. I have no idea of anything at this point. So I just have to kind of make assumptions. And one of the assumptions is, is that breaching in through this white building right here or this white building right here is safer than doing just about anything else to try to get into this milk factory. Yeah, I mean, I would say that's a fairly safe assumption there. So, let's see what else we can parcel about. I do have the Sturmgeschütz. The Sturmgeschütz's best use is probably direct fire roll with a long line of sight because I don't want to get him close to the enemy. I want him to hold him back. So the question is, is this milk factory in a position whereby he can provide effective direct fire support? Maybe from the tram depot we could fire across like this and hit targets on the back side of the milk factory. So that's something to consider. Firing from the tram depot over to here. Another option is to actually try to get my Sturmgeschütz out onto the open ground over here, which would allow me to command the back side of Usingo block and use direct fire high explosive to break up any enemies I see in here. And also, if I can get him on an elevated position 
Although, if you look around, given the preponderance of trees on this map, there's really no point in actually getting up here. It doesn't provide any significant advantage. It's not a piece of key terrain. It's just, you know, it's nice looking, but it doesn't really help. So it's probably better to keep the Sturmgeschutz in a central location, and we'll just, I'm going to add him to my reserve platoon right here. So the goal of 3rd Platoon, the job of 3rd Platoon, is going to be a reserve. They're going to parcel out reinforcements to wherever needs it, and they'll be on call just in case I need to open up a second front somewhere else. But ostensibly, their assigned objective is going to be East Block down here. So we're going to keep an eye on them for that. This is the... Heavy Weapons Platoon HQ and two machine guns. We'll just kind of theoretically assign them to 3rd Platoon for now because there's not much else to use them on. The other Breach team is just going to hang out with the Company HQ or theoretically I could send him down here and he could be part of the reserve. So if we spot a target that's good for breaching, we can send in 3rd Platoon in order to breach it and exploit it. In the meantime, I might as well mount up my HQ and stuff in the vehicle because they'll have access to the radios. It'll give them better communication with the platoons, or at least some of them. This guy is going to mount in the support half-track. This one is a bit strange. It's got that wacky 20mm uh, gun on the front. Such a weird, such a weird mount. I also can't tell how this little turret thing is supposed to be supported. There's no floor underneath it. You notice that? Unless the shield is directly attached. Oh, it's directly attached to the gun, and the gun rotates around the mount. Or at least it can traverse left and right. I don't know if it's a full 360 mount. That is so bizarre. So bizarre. And this particular half-track, one thing to note... Let's pull them back out. If I tell it, can I tell it to open up? No. That means the machine gun on the half track can only be used by the passengers. That's one thing you want to keep an eye on with your half tracks. So here is our heavy machine gun platoon mounted up. That's our company HQ mounted up. Um. Kuba wagon can hang out at the rear of the column. The stug is going to be in the front. So I can put the platoon leader in the Kubel. Mostly because there's no reason to uh, expose the platoon leader to enemy fire. The Kuba wagon itself does not have a radio. In fact, I don't think any of these trucks have radios. No, they're just trucks. So, that would work for getting these guys moved around quickly. So, first squad is going to be in the first truck. Second squad can be in the second truck. Third squad can be in the third truck. And the breach team that was attached, I'm going to put them with second squad. So the order of operations for 3rd Platoon, the Reserve Platoon, is the Sturmgeschutz will go first. And I'm going to remember to button him up. The Sturmgeschutz goes first, provides direct fire if needed. Basically, he's, his job is to roll into the ambush first. Like I said, the enemy mostly relying on small arms, given the fact that they're British Airborne. They will probably have Piats, so it's a good idea to try to keep him remote if possible. Like I said, the vehicles are just for transport. They're not for assaulting. We're not going to be rolling up to a house and jumping out of the vehicle and trying to get in there. No, these are just to get the platoon or the squad across the map where they need to go as quickly as possible. And on a map like this, with hard ground all over the place and streets, there's no reason not to just use the fast command with your vehicles everywhere they go. There's literally no reason. 
one of the things to note when you're using vehicles is if there's no reason not to drive fast, then you should drive fast. Because vehicles don't get tired, so it doesn't matter. So with first platoon, the vehicle has one particular purpose, and that is to protect the platoon leader and the breach team. The rest of these guys are going in on foot, so we're going to conduct them like a regular infantry attack. In fact, let's break them down so they're ready to go. So one thing to note, these guys only have three men in each team. And the gunner is at his most efficient when he's served by an assistant gunner. As you can see, one of the guys in the team automatically goes over to the gunner and gets into position as an assistant gunner. So when you're in this kind of situation and you've only got two guys that are free, you've got the assistant leader and the team leader free, everybody else is either a gunner or an assistant gunner, you don't want to grab an assault team out of this, you just want to split your teams. So what we then have is team leader armed with a scoped uh, car 98, then we have gunner and assistant gunner in both teams. And this particular squad is not going to be at the front of the advance. You're going to want somebody who can detach an assault team. So we also have this squad here, which is divided in much the same way. So what we have here is a series of supporting support teams, tiny little light machine gun teams that can go around and do things. So the very spearhead of our advance is going to be this squad. They have an assault team there, and they have a full heavy support team here, used in the same fashion that I described. You have your support team provide base of fire, then your assault team actually goes in and assaults. And they have 14 hand grenades available to them, because they have so many dudes. And then all the rest of these teams are just going to be miscellaneous support teams. So after these guys assault a position and clear it, you park one of these guys in there just to provide base of fire and occupation. And then your platoon leader just follows on behind in the half track. And he's also responsible for providing ammunition resupply. We've got 9 mil and 7.92 AP, lots of it. So we can use it with everybody because two of these small teams have 9 mil in them. And my assault team also has 9 mil in it, along with the platoon HQ and the breach team. So we we'll probably use a lot of that. And then finally, on the foot on the foot mobile platoon over here, I've already got these two squads broken up. This squad is broken up as well. A little a little strange looking. I mean, it does give me a three man assault team with seven grenades. That's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. We also have the HMG teams back here, one with a 34 and one with a 42. So they can help provide heavy suppressive fires as well. And other than that, the conduct of the battle is going to take place as a foot mobile move to contact along this axis over here towards the milk factory and along this axis over here towards the school objective over here. This using L block, this very long block of houses, is, as far as I'm concerned, a secondary objective. The idea for this would be to dominate the open ground beyond the block, and then we can actually attack the block from this side, as opposed to trying to take this side down this street, and then come through these little courtyards into these buildings. That would be a very stupid way to do it. Right. You want to try to attack into a built-up area from an area which you can provide heavy suppressive fire. And I could send the Sturmgeschutz with 2nd Platoon over here, and the Sturmgeschutz could easily provide 75mm HE against the entire front face of all of these buildings. Which is great, because if I get my guys into these buildings one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, push the enemy out with 75 direct fire HE, then follow it up with my infantry, and when the enemy retreats into the courtyard back here, my guys can enter the building and shoot them. So that would work pretty good. In fact, it might work well enough that I might just commit my 3rd platoon to following 2nd platoon, and actually have 3rd platoon hook all the way around over here, around the school, and then attack east block from this side. 
that might work but I will have to deal with this underpass area at some point. This part under the bridge is likely going to be the most difficult place to attack just because the line of sight is so restrictive. And I don't know if these stairways are functional or no, I think they're just set dressing. That's too bad. Wouldn't it be cool to come up here on the bridge and then go down the, go down the stairs? That would be nuts. I mean, it would be it would be awful to do that, but one of the things to note is that this building over here does have line of sight onto this building over here. So this is a piece of key terrain I need to capture in order to secure the area. Does it have windows on this side? It does. Yeah, that one building in the very back over here dominates this entire interior area. So one possible approach would be to send a team of infantry down around the back side of the bridge and into this building here. Now, once again, that's scripting rather than planning, but it's just something to keep in mind. As you traverse the camera around the map and you look around the map, one of the things you want to note is little factoids like that. Like, hey, here's a good way to approach this. You know, we could lay down some smoke. We could lay down some smoke right here. We have, I think we have mortar smoke available, don't we? Does my mortar have smoke? Yeah, I've got a little bit of mortar smoke. I've got 105 smoke. And I even have rocket smoke available. So it's like I could do a smoke mission over here in this corner, smoke the whole place up, and then I could get my team right down here into this building just using standard bounding overwatch and assault tactic right into the building put down base of fire in all directions and blammo we've got an interior position because getting in over here is actually rather difficult the whole front of this building can look down the street here but like I said if we get our machine guns into this house here they can dominate all the way down the front I could get a team into the rear and once you've got front and back of a position then the position is effectively yours I mean, we'd still need to kick in the door, but that's besides the point. Not to mention, I could provide some direct fire support, say, from the Sturmgeschutz down here in the Tram Depot. Once again, that's a mark to use the Tram Depot for the Sturmgeschutz, as I can actually park him over here. I can use him against the front of the milk factory, and I can also drive him up into this little cubby, and I can shoot him down against this house over here. Just something to think about. Like I said, when you when you traverse the map around and you're looking at the map, you should you should just kind of take note of little things like that. Like this this building is vulnerable from this direction. That building is vulnerable from out back. This building has a line of sight all the way down this street. These are things you want to keep in mind so that as you're actually fighting the scenario, you can say you know if you get into a situation where it becomes necessary, you can say, oh yeah, I'll just put a machine gun in here and that'll help. You know, so if you're having trouble developing the situation or you run into some stubborn resistance, think back to those little points that you've saved up in your mind and say, is there any one of these that can help? And if they can, do them. Anyway, I think that's about it. I mean, there you go. There's a, there's a scenario briefing. I'm fairly certain it's going to work out just fine. You know, I'd say I'm about... 60% certain. I don't think this is going to be a particularly difficult scenario given it's the first one in the in the campaign. But as I understand it, this campaign is is one of the more difficult ones in this game. So, we'll see what happens. Anyway, I'm General Jack Ripper. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed and uh, we'll catch you some other time. Okay, bye.